Hello everyone and welcome to this month's episode of the Show Club Podcast, simply for the Cyber Threat Briefing. Today I'm joined, as always, by Hugh Rayner. Welcome Hugh. And this month we've managed to get the diaries aligned we've got Aaron with us as well. So Aaron, welcome back to the, the podcast. Now we've had you on in previous episodes, so it's good to good to have you back with us. So how are you both doing? Uh, it's uh, well, the week off Shrove Tuesday. How's, uh, how was the pancakes? Too many. I had pancakes for lunch and dinner. And I actually had pancakes the night before because I was testing my pancake making skills. So I've had too many pancakes. That's it for the year now. <laughs> you? Yeah, we had some, some pretty nice pancakes on Tuesday. All good. Yeah, breakfast, lunch, dinner and the night before as well. Or just... No, just nine o'clock. Good. All right. Well, I didn't. I didn't quite have many as you are, and I had a few. But there you go. Oh, good. And how was the how was the mix of your skills? Were they there? Well, they weren't on the, the night when I was testing. I ended up making the worst pancakes. It weren't pancakes. They were just piles of slop. But uh, I mastered it by the by lunchtime the next day. <laughs> Very good, very good. Good. So shall we get into it, guys? Uh, I've got quite a lot to get through today. Some interesting stuff in there, and it's been a relatively busy month, as it always is in cyber. So let's crack, let's crack in. So we've got a couple of bits. One we consider to be a hot topic, I guess, is what we've kind of said, and that is around uh, geopolitics in cyber. And there's been a, quite a few news articles, uh, quite a few bits of intelligence around things that nation states are doing, activities that they might be doing. Uh, we're going to get dive into that a little bit today to kind of just try and dissect it a little bit. We've then got two recent incidents to talk through as well. So we've got the, the one that's that's kind of a couple of days old, and that's the GoDaddy compromise, which is allegedly a couple of years old. And also the, the Reddit one, not hugely interested in the sense of what's what's in that that particular attack but uh, there's a couple of learning points i think things that we can take away to uh, give to the audience around you know how did they respond to it what were the good points of it and yeah kind of that there's an indication of a good culture there i think already in that respect so we're going to cover those those three items up so without further ado we'll, we'll get into it and we'll start there with the, the geopolitics angle um so he's been a couple of news articles as you might expect with everything that's going on in at the moment they are kind of in our, in our world the western world they are targeted towards russia etc places like that and there's been a number of kind of mentions around russian activity towards western you know interesting targets um there was the one in the news around uh, um, the Netherlands kind of a, a physically ended up being it looks like a physical espionage type activity, which as we well know hasn't is not a new thing. That's something that's been going on for, for a number of years. Uh, and there was also something around an attack that happened uh, in in Denmark or against a, Den- a Danish company. So Aaron, I know you've got some thoughts on that. So I'm gonna bring you into the conversation there straight away, if that's okay, and we'll we'll kind of cover this angle off. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's it's an interesting time for geopolitics. I'm sure everyone is aware. And it's not to say that this is something that suddenly appeared, right? Even with regards to cyber attacks, they've been going on for a long time, uh, even before the current conflicts that we see ourselves in, in in Eastern Europe. The the interesting thing is that we're getting a lot more visibility of it. and I think the reason we're getting a lot more visibility of it is because we are starting to see accessibility to conducting a cyber attack. So the bar to entry has been lowered significantly as tensions have risen and ideologies have come into play for various individuals. Groups have formed that are largely just activists, just, you know, people at home who don't have any specialist skills can now get involved and sign up to support their uh, preferred nation state and target their least preferred nation state using really simple tools and techniques. So a good example is the Danish attack that happened in January. That was an attack that took place on the 9th to 11th, 11th of January and targeted, I think, seven Danish banks plus the central bank. And that was conducted by a Russian activist group that's known to be aligned to the government, uh, I think No Name 057. And that was largely just a DDoS attack. And it was a DDoS attack that was possible thanks to the fact that lots of people had signed up and uh, decided to just start sending traffic to the various agencies and banks within within Denmark. Uh, those sorts of attacks, they weren't so common before, for example, the current conflict in Ukraine. You wouldn't get the average citizen joining in to conduct an attack like that. You'd often instead see the government aligned organizations. So we're talking about the advanced persistent threat types of groups. So things like Cold River, Fancy Bear, if you want to throw the Russian names. And there are, of course, equivalent Western organizations as well that are government aligned. They tend to operate a little bit more behind the scenes. So they're not really going for the headline grabbing attacks. They're targeting critical national infrastructure. They're looking for ways into government agencies. And often either news is suppressed or just doesn't reach the general public because the effect on the general public is perceived as being minimal most of the time. Whereas if you've got a group of hackers, activists that want some publicity, they go after public websites 
like banks, like services that citizens use day in, day out, local authorities, hospitals, things like that, they become a target and then they reach the news. And that's why we're starting to see lots of news articles over the last six to 12 months, whereby the this of or Russia has hacked this, or we've hacked that. And I think there's a really important point here as well, that it's not just Russia with hacktivist groups. Again, focusing a bit on the, the conflict in Ukraine, there's a group called the IT Army of Ukraine. And that's just formed of citizens around the world, not even just Ukrainians. And it's, it's largely organized or believed to be organized by the Ukrainian government as a coordination effort. But the actual members of that group are just day-to-day -day citizens. And joining that group is as easy as logging into a messaging application and saying, I want to join a DDoS attack with a bot. And then you've joined a DDoS attack and there are new targets posted daily. The other thing that's interesting as a result of that group and other groups like it is actually Russia is suffering massively from outages across all of their public sector and citizen facing services and have been for the last year. So everything from banking to major retail websites to new services, even Putin's speech that happened earlier this week was subject to a DDoS attack by groups like the IT Army of Ukraine. So it's very much a tug of war as such between what's happening from certain nation states to other nation states and vice versa. And that citizen ideology almost coming into play here. Yeah, quite right. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not necessarily, you, you look at a business or a compromise of a business. Yeah, okay. And a DDoS attack against a something that we all use, let's say, for, when we're going to talk about later on, let's say if you DDoS Reddit, for example, it just goes offline for a little while and it will come back eventually. But when you talk about the elements that you mentioned there, financial services, healthcare, that, those are the kind of things that underpin society. So you're not necessarily needing, ultimately, to go and compromise a bunch of user data or you know get a fold on some service. That'd be quite nice. Don't, don't get me wrong if you're in that, if, you, if you're operating these campaigns. But the ultimate aim of the goal here, right, is to, to disrupt, ultimately, right? So it's to take things offline that underpin society and therefore you're going to disrupt that societal movement ultimately and that's kind of roughly what we're talking about here right yeah absolutely they want the publicity behind it they, they want to show an impact show their ideology there are some good examples of you know innocuous attacks almost that were by and large harmless there was a good example i think um was discussed not that long ago around uh the yandex taxi app in moscow was was breached and hundreds of taxis were sent to the exact same place in Moscow. The real impact of that is fairly minimal, except on traffic and, and people ordering taxis. But the, the publicity something like that generates where there's this visual impact of hundreds of taxis and people are uh, spreading videos around of this having happened has an effect, I'm not going to say whether it's positive or negative, I think in the broad scheme of things, you know, as, as humanity, it's a negative thing, but it has an effect on the people watching it. There's a psychological element of, oh, Russia's done this, or this has happened to Russia, ha ha, look at them, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's got that element of um, citizen vigilantism almost within it. But there's also, if we flip back to the nation state actor side type of attacks, they tend to not be as, as well noticed simply because they aren't necessarily going for that public impact. They're going for gathering data. They're going for the, the really difficult breach. They're not going for a DDoS attack or something that just takes a service that a citizen is looking for offline. They're looking to gain sensitive information from critical national infrastructure or from government agencies uh, on, on both sides of the, the fence. So there's, it's important to know that difference as well. The targets and the impact are, are different between hacktivism and nation states. So we're talking where you become towards cyber warfare. And I know that's a, it's a, it's a, a podcast that we recorded probably a year ago, kind of right at the start of the conflict. Didn't realize how long the conflict was going to go on for, obviously. Um, but I think there'll be still some key points within that, that, that episode that we did back then around, you know, what was it all about? What does it all mean? Um, how it hang together? But you're kind of saying that there are activists, um, who might be, sanctioned, let's say, they might be given the, the permissions to, to do certain activities on behalf of an nation state, but they're generally looking at low-hanging fruit and, and taking service offline, but when you talk about the the actual efforts of that nation state themselves, then maybe they're, you might consider them to be their internal team, if you like, um, they're going to be going after much more impactful targets, um, looking for that actual compromise around just taking some offline for a, a period of time, right? Exactly. It's a broad spectrum and it needs to be in cyber warfare, like any warfare. You don't just focus on one thing. You're going to have your, your A game almost uh, targeting those really critical things that are doing something that's actually of value to you as a nation by targeting your enemies. And then you've got the more general distraction almost, the, the publicity generating side of it, the propaganda side of it. There's some examples uh, of Russia targeting U.S. critical national infrastructure last year and attempting to gain secrets from nuclear facilities. That's relatively well publicized. And on the flip side, as a result of the conflict, we've seen things um, like 
there's a, there's actually a piece of ransomware now called RU underscore ransom that's specifically targeting Russian infrastructure to, to cause disruption at their critical national infrastructure sites and government agencies. So yeah, it's it's important to understand it's a spectrum and you assign different people to different parts of that spectrum in, in cyber warfare, much like traditional warfare. And that's something that has really come to the forefront in the last year or so. It's made us realize how how broad of a spectrum and, and how sophisticated and coordinated a lot of this now is. We've heard things like you know organized crime, hacktivists, uh, script kiddies, and nation states being those sort of threat actor groups pretty commonly bandied around over the last few years. But we're really starting to see how all of those can work together in a sphere to form cyber warfare as a concept. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and obviously it'll be, It'll be happening all the time. So we we talked about it a year ago. It's not like it'll have been a little bit, then a break, and a little bit, and a break. It'll be pretty much consistent, I would imagine, for the last 12 months. And yet, you're quite right, there's, there's quite juicy targets out there. Um, what can, if you're an operator, um, Aaron, Hugh, whoever wants to take this question, but if there's an op if you're an operator of something important, let's, let's for argument's sake, let's say it's a water treatment plant or, you know, something that's kind of, you know, important to the day-to-day the -day lives of people, um, what kind of key metric or what kind of key things can you do now to, to start to safeguard your facility or plant? I'll give an initial response then, Hugh, if you want to chip in with some additional. I would say awareness. Awareness is really important right now for any organization that's dealing in public sector, critical national infrastructure, or may and may think they could be a target is to, to look, subscribe to the streams such as the NCSC CISP sharing portal. Uh, make sure you're getting streams from your vendors and partners uh, to make sure that you've got up-to-date information of what's going on. What are the attacks that are happening right now? That can then help inform yourselves to understand where you need to focus your attention to defend. If you're seeing alerts from um, certain agencies that there's a lot going on in this sphere right now, we'll focus your attention in that sphere, for example, public websites or phishing attacks. Or if you're seeing an increase in DDoS attacks, consider understanding the impacts of DDoS to your organization and perhaps consider if there's the possibility for you to do some mitigations, whether that's doing some agreement with your upstream internet provider or putting something like a protective service like Cloudflare in front of your website to minimize the impacts of the sorts of attacks you think you're likely to receive. Okay, good. That's good advice. So be, be aware essentially to understand what's going on and I, I guess understand what you are protecting first and foremost. Um, and I might add to that is the understand where the ingress points are. So if you're talking about a control system, chances are, and you, should, you, know, you cross your fingers and hope not, but the vast majority of that plant and facility shouldn't be anywhere near the internet. Um, but there might well be gateways um, from trusted networks, all the trusted networks into that control system. So understand the, how an attacker may structure an attack to get to a, a certain set of uh, important pieces of infrastructure, let's say. Um, and then we cross our fingers and hope that there isn't just stuff hanging out there on the internet, like PLCs and things that control processes. You kind of, cross, I, I don't, you don't see it, tend, you don't tend to see it too often um, in kind of developed countries, but you do tend to see it fairly, more, more regularly than you'd hope in, in kind of developing countries or countries who are, uh, are not necessarily at the forefront of cyber and, and so on and so forth. Um, Hugh, anything you wanted to add to Aaron's response? Yeah, yeah. So Aaron, Aaron touched on you know protective services like Cloudflare that can can respond to you know increasing demand, specifically looking against you know distributed denial of service attacks, um, as as we've been talking about. I think it's really important to understand what normal looks like. Having that baseline of how much traffic do we typically receive on a typical day? You know, what are the usage spikes? What you know, what do they look like? What what does our graph of activity on on this resource look like? So that you know, we don't we don't end up getting to the point where you know you you can't support any more connections to your site as as the sort of first point that you realize something's going on. You know, you can sort of see that that slow upwards. Um, increase in, in utilization and, you know, leveraging things like Cloudflare and content delivery networks and things like that, um, you know, will, will really, really help because, yeah, exactly. I think the majority of the sort of hacktivist things that we see are tend, do tend to be sort of denial of service attacks. They, they get publicized in the media to the same extent as a, you know, really sophisticated, you know, attack on a, on a nuclear centrifuge or something like that. But they're also really good because from from a perspective of, of um, efficacy, because they sort of snowball right on both sides. You've got these people then say, oh, look, oh, my, my nation's health service was just taken down by a, by a DDoS attack. 
oh, but that was just citizens doing that. Oh, right, I better enroll in, in, in my nation's similar program to, you know, fight back and, and things, you know, rapidly escalate and snowball from there. So I think that's, a, you know, a really interesting point. Excellent, thank you, yeah. A final one to cover on this, and it's a little bit related, but maybe not fully related, is around that there was, there was a, an article there around um, interception, so interception of uh, citizens' data, um, and this was kind of related to Russia, so I don't think it's a massive secret that there's a lot of um, nations in the world that are probably doing some form of interception on on their uh, citizens' data, depending on where that might be. Obviously, if you control everything coming in and out of a, a region, a country, a, a, a location, chances are you can do something with that data if you would, if you so wish to do so. Um, so I don't think it's an unreasonable assumption to, to think that people, other countries, are doing it beyond kind of Russia. But what, what's the what's the implication there, Aaron, from a societal point of view for this is this interception piece? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. This and actually, let, let's be clear: it's it's a difficult subject to bridge, and most people perhaps don't know or, or prefer to, to not know that the the concept of lawful interception is fairly well established in even democracies across the West. You know, it, it's actually a requirement for internet service providers and anyone that's logging call data to keep a log of that for a number of years, so that uh, so that the authorities can access it when requested via a court order. The interesting implication here is down to trust. How much do we trust that the authorities and those organizations are only allowing access to that data when there is a lawful court order that provides the, the framework for that access to happen? The challenge with, with, with countries like Russia is actually, do we trust the government to only follow a legal framework to gain access to data? And I think that's really where the, the news articles have come from here. Uh, Russia is saying that they're also collecting all this data, but actually they're not going through court orders to collect it. They're just looking at it as and when they like. Now, we can argue that that doesn't happen in the West. We don't know for sure whether or not it does happen uh, because no one tells us. So it's it's a matter of trust more than it is that this is something exceptional that Russia is doing. It's something that's commonplace across the world, that your data is being stored for the purposes of uh, investigation if you are ever in, implicated in a crime of some sort. So it's... It's a bit of a, um, a a topic that's difficult to broach because it, it depends on the level of trust we have in our government organisations. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, as as a general Joe public in the in the street kind of person, should I care ultimately? Should I care that things have been, you know, captured, monitored, intercepted? I think it comes down to the expectation of privacy. I would love to say that nothing should be captured because I know I'm not doing anything wrong and I think the government should trust me. But also I fully understand that actually the data that is being captured about me, I know it's being captured by the organization my data flows through. So for example, my mobile phone provider, I know, they know that I'm accessing websites. They know that I'm uh, making phone calls and receiving text messages. They have to because they're processing that data. The fact that they're storing it for me, the main thing is that they're storing it appropriately, safeguarding it appropriately, and making sure that the only time anyone else can ever access it is if there is a solid legal basis for that. And I want my organization that I'm dealing with to, to only provide access in those lawful situations. I think we're quite lucky in the West that we have a whistleblower culture almost, whereby organizations will often say, actually, no, I don't think the government should be doing this. And we have that freedom of dialogue. In countries where that doesn't exist, or where organizations are very much under the heel of governments, it becomes much more challenging to confront when the government is doing something beyond what would be considered reasonable, or when organizations are doing something beyond what is considered reasonable if the citizens don't have as much freedom of, of expression and the power to impactfully change things in that country. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. We're, we're quite, um, we're quite lucky i guess in where we live in that respect and where we're all we're all coming from in that respect in the, in the west um what is probably important for people to understand um when they travel you know ultimately if you if you're going to travel to a not so um trusted country for instance, for instance then there's a chance that your data there is going to get captured monitored intercepted and so that's a that's a, obviously something to, to bear in mind as that happens um you don't know if you want to come in on this particular point let's, 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 let's not forget um you know, Mr. Snowden's revelations around the, the prison program and things like that, um, around the controls and, and, and things about accessing that data. So certainly this is this is not in any way a, a Russia exclusive issue. Um, in terms of sort of thoughts on that that interception in general, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite inclined to agree with Aaron in that 
um, that that data sort of does need to be collected, that, that metadata specifically, um, because of the benefit it can offer. I mean, I certainly don't subscribe to the view that if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, right? That, that some people present because, um, you know, We've all got we've all got doors on our bathrooms, right? But nothing illegal happens in there. There's 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 a natural inclination for for privacy. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the key there is is having confidence and an understanding of the you know the the reasons and the um, and the process behind that that data being accessed and processed. Yeah, yeah agreed. Um, so are you tell me you don't take the door off your bathroom when you move into your house. No, open plan everywhere. Open plan everywhere. There's nothing to hide, yeah, ultimately. Exactly. No front door either. <laughs> well, happy days. I'm going to pop around, see what I can find. <laughs> Good. All right. So we've 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 uh, we've rattled on about geopolitics for quite some time there, and some really good points. I will add. So thank you guys. And um, should we cover the two um, two recentish kind of breaks of of incidents, compromises, if you like, um, and we'll maybe we'll do them together. We kind of just but you know, one straight to the other. Um, so the go, we'll cover the GoDaddy one first. Um, so a little bit of a background that seems to be coming out is that there seems to be a, an indication that there's been a, a compromise that has lasted in the region of a few years is what the, is what's kind of being said. Um, it looks like it's kind of pointed towards the, um, the, the kind of, you know, shared hosting services that the GoDaddy that offer, I think you mentioned twenty eight thousand user websites were were kind of maliciously redirecting people to, you know, a, a, you know, a type of control domains at some point to, to deliver malware. Um, but what I don't want, I don't necessarily want to focus on the intricacies of that attack, right? So it's a couple of years old. The details of it actually happening and how people got foothold in there probably quite sketchy at this point, a couple of years down the line. If they do manage to pull that back, then fair play. There'll be a bigger question as to why they didn't spot that originally. If the logs are there, the information's there. But let's let's move past that. And what I want to talk about actually is the is the implications of the things that are happening here. So shared hosting, you know, is that good or bad? Um, we understand. Yeah, we all know that cPanel is quite popular for shared hosting environments. Seems to be an over reliance on that that particular uh, piece of software, perhaps. So we can now talk about that. How does the shared responsibility model apply um, to shared hosting? The implication is it's probably, it's probably shared, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and then maybe a question that either of you can come in on is, is how do we unpick a long-term compromise? So, you know, GoDaddy won't be the only people in the world who have realized that they've been under attack for a number of years. Where do you start? Like, how do you get back to a point where you trust everything that's happened? So maybe we we'll take it from the top. Hugh, do you want to talk to the top is about shared hosting and what that means and what it's all about? Yeah, sure. So. Um, yeah, so GoDaddy, you know, big provider, domains, hosting, all, all that sort of thing. I think the, so the, 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 there's various tiers of, of, of different ways that we can host our website, right? We can do it all, our, all ourselves and, you know, a cloud provider like AWS or Azure. We can use shared hosting like, like we're talking about here where your data is, is just sat on that same environment as all of the other web, um, all of the other new customers on that on that node, you share an IP address. It's your your, your host header that's sent with the um, web request that decides which website you see. There's there's very little segregation between um, your data and the data of other customers on that on that shared hosting account. You've also got things like virtual private servers, um, which are you know you're running on the same piece of tin but virtualized. That's that's, that's more robust and dedicated servers as well. Obviously, the the cost um, implication there. Um, you know, increases with each of those levels, which is why shared hosting is a is a common solution. Um, certainly for things like individual blogs, small sort of hobbyist grade websites, shared hosting is you know reasonably fine. I wouldn't really object to that. Um, certainly, if you're if you're hosting or controlling data that that does want some sort of level of segregation, um, shared hosting probably isn't the place to look because by virtue of the fact that it is all running off that same environment. If there is sort of a deeper compromise of that uh, machine that's that's hosting that, you know, everyone's on that same environment. So someone else can can get their website compromised, and, and effectively you are too. Okay, excellent. So it's basically your your website sat alongside twenty five, thirty other people's websites, all on the same system, essentially. Um, how do you, as a service provider, it's, it's going to be tough, right, to to really segregate access level controls at that point. That you know, it's, it wouldn't be out of the realms of possibility to 
break out of the user account that you get given to set things up and run commands, etc. So I can I can totally see how this kind of thing happens in this kind of environment for sure. Absolutely. And I guess you know the, the the common tools that are used for this. You know, cPanel is used for the administration of these websites from the user's perspective. Things like um, Web Host Manager, WHM, WHMCS are used for you know, the administration of a lot of these sort of shared hosting platforms. It's quite easy to set up your own little web hosting business just by you know buying some server space and then divvying it out. Certainly, if if that gets compromised, you know the WHM um, end of things. Then yeah, exactly. That is all customers' data running on that on that environment that that's gone. Yeah, for sure. So Aaron, maybe you can come in here and talk to me a little bit more about cPanel. And um, it's it's really widely used, right? So it's it's not just GoDaddy that uses it. There are any other kind of self hosting. Uh, so, uh, yes, shared hosting uh, provider is going to be probably cPanel. I would imagine. Um, there's clearly a, a, a single point of failure in the supply chain here. I'm, I'm saying. I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, if you over rely on a single tool, the open source tool that's uh, popular, etc., then um, yeah, I, I think you you do fall into the same trap as as largely Hugh has has laid out that you're limiting your options. There, there are of course various other easy to put together website providers out there, but uh, I don't think any go necessarily to the, the same level of accessibility and, and ease that cPanel does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a, a compromise or a vulnerability in cPanel. It affects like genuinely thousands of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sites, hostings, and so on and so forth. So that yeah, it's quite an important piece of the jigsaw, and probably an under underrepresented piece of the jigsaw as well. I would say. Um, we talk about shared responsibility model, particularly around cloud. Um, shared hosting is is probably cloud. You might consider it under that under that banner. What what's the shared responsibility model look like for um a shared hosting provider? I know it's like if you're on-prem everything is clearly your own, it's your own responsibility. Um, all the way kind of an IaaS might be a mixture, it's a, it's a part-way thing where the, the provider will look after the TIN, uh, probably operating system, and then from there onwards it's yourself. So where does shared hosting sit into this, into this um, model ultimately? Yeah, so shared hosting, well, you've, you've typically got, in, in the traditional view, three senses of, of, of shared hosting. Much like you do with uh, you know software as a service, platform as a service, and then just having the the hardware as a service. Um, with shared hosting, you can go for the the typical model whereby you've got a, a shared environment that other websites are hosted on. Much as as Hugh mentioned, you could also have it where just the physical machine is shared. So you've got a sort of time share, and you don't really know what you're getting. Uh, Amazon's EC2 instance is a bit like this in some cases. And then you've got the, you're renting a machine in a broader cluster. So you've got the a full physical machine to yourself, but that physical machine is potentially part of, of a larger network of devices. But it, it's actually much more complicated than that when you dive down to it. Using AWS as an example, anyone that's had any uh, attempt to, to understand the various models within AWS of what you can buy and uh, what capacity you get and the amount of data you're allowed. It's actually such a blurred model these days. You can't even split it into the, the individual trust relationships that you may or may not have. But the, the key thing really is to understand from your perspective as an organization, what your data requirements are and the, the level of risk you're willing to accept in your environment. If you know that you are fairly risk averse as an organization, so a, a low risk tolerance, you probably want to avoid the shared tiers, the, the cheaper tiers of hosting and go for where you get your own dedicated hardware. Um, and that, that reduces that level of risk to you as an organization. You still have the risks of it's a third party hosted system and you, the physical location is accessible by a third party and that third party might have some administrative capabilities over it, but you, you minimize the risk of the hardware itself and the uh, being impacted by the actions of others because you have control over the software that's running on it. You might have some control over the patching of it as well, as opposed to being reliant on the other shared provider having not patched their server uh, or their their uh, environment within that same shared hosting environment. Okay. So as always, it comes back to a cost security trade-off basically. Well, you know, and then it comes back to then what Hugh's point earlier on was, yeah, stuff like personal blogs and things that are not really high value, you could put on there, right? But your crown jewels, probably not, is not where you'd want to put them. Okay. So guys, tell me a little bit more about how do we kind of unpick such a long-term compromise. So um, I remember we start with you and, and um, Hugh can bring you into that one as well. Um, this GoDaddy was a couple of years, apparently active for a couple of years. 
So where do you start? Do you just burn the whole lot to the ground and start again? Or is there, is there some middle ground where you can kind of recover back to a state where you trust what's going on? There's one, I don't want to call it a silver lining, but I can't think of a better word. There's one upside to having compromise that's so long term is that you're not necessarily chasing the clock as much as you would be on a new compromise. The damage is largely already done. And what that allows you to do is a thorough investigation and really understand whether the thing that you've now identified has, has um, had access to your network or, or your systems for an extended period of time. You can slowly but thoroughly check that there are no other indicators of compromise across the network and then take action and uh, stop all of it in one go, as opposed to kind of chase the rabbit. You know, you identify one thing, try and cut them off there, but actually you've, you've kind of now alerted them to the fact you know that uh, they've compromised your network and they're now trying to scramble as well. And then you start the chase. So when you've got a, a very long-term compromise, it's often important to take into consideration, actually, how do we want to approach cleaning this up? Burning everything is is you know, not really an option for most businesses, I think. So it's a matter of understanding what has been compromised, the level of access, the, the level of um, integrity loss and confidentiality loss that your organization has been subjected to, and then take the, the measures needed to kind of block it all in, in as thorough way as possible and then resume business normal operations, which would be a depending on the, the compromise, of course, it might be re-imaging some systems. It might be having a thorough look at the, the user accounts and privileges, password rotation, all of those corrective actions that can vary massively. Okay, thanks. Um, and then we talk about baselining what normal looks like you. Um, if this has been going on for a couple of years, you might end up accidentally baselining, you know, a compromise activity ultimately, and then the future on, you just assume that's normal. Is that, could that, could that be a problem here? It's absolutely a risk, right? It's why, you know, things like that shouldn't really be a, a one and done exercise. Um, you want to be constantly, constantly sort of you know, maybe annually based doing, doing those sort of baseline checks, making sure that, okay, does normal today look the same as it did previously? And it could be a great way of, you know, spotting some of these initial compromises. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know you personally help a number of our clients kind of navigate the early parts of a, what they, they might perceive to be a, a, a an incident let's say um what are the kind of three key things that you see happen regularly that would preclude kind of a a, 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 a sensible response happening or a sensible recovery happening what kind of three kind of points can the, the, the listeners take away yeah so i guess um commonly people are concerned about malware right um and whether processes have been modified um when, when we see incidents like this um, so things like file hash integrity checking, really useful. Um, you know, you can, you can automate that to, to run across your environment. Again, baselining, as you mentioned, if, if when you first set this up, there's a compromise, you, you won't notice that, but, you know, scanning, scanning through your files just to make sure that commonly used processes, applications and things like that still have that same file hash gives you sort of that, that confidence that, um, you know, things haven't been modified there. Um, I have, well, well, what I can add then from experience is, um, log files being a default size so have been called into numerous responses where something happened, ask the sensible questions of, uh, well, what logs have we got? Can we start to analyze them? And then you look at it's the default and it only therefore logged the last one hour of activity. So anything prior to that's out the window. I'm assuming that might happen here, right? So this is a couple of years old, that initial vector might not be, it may have been logged, but may have since been deleted. Um, perhaps, um, but we'll, we'll, I guess time will tell. But yeah, so he's, I, think, I guess my advice would be make sure that you understand what's configured from an audit and logging perspective. Is it a default level? What does the default get you? Is it enough? I guess is the other question to ask. You don't want to, you don't want to log everything forever, um, but there's obviously a happy medium beyond the last hour as well. So yeah, that'd be kind of my, my final advice. And then I, I suppose the bit would be stress test things, right? So assume this might happen and what, how do you recover then at that point? So make sure that the, the, the plans procedures are tested and have been stress tested in not necessarily in a real world. You don't want to test them in the real world first off, but you know, in a, in a controlled environment initially, that, that'd be a good place to be. I think on the logging, that's, that's a really important point, right? Is, you know, we've seen it time and time again, where, you know, person responsible for system A says, great, I think I'm sending the logs through. Can, can you please verify that in the scene? And they say, yep, we're receiving the logs. But, you know, we, we, we see that's not sufficient, right? If 
you you might not be getting the right logs. You might just be getting you know basic authentication logs. But the person in the team sees that something's coming through and assumes that that's all that they should have been receiving. So making sure that you understand what logs you're sending uh, and what you should be receiving um, to make sure that, that that you know that logging, monitoring, and auditing is actually set up the way you think it is. It's important as well to note from the perspective of a long term compromise. You've got two additional problems, which is that what is actually malicious activity might have been going on for so long that it's considered normal. You, you don't know that it's malicious anymore because it's been happening for so long, but also subversion of logging. If someone's been on your network for a long time, they may well have disabled the specific logs they don't want you to see, and they're no longer sent to your seam or they were never sent to wherever you, you send logs to in the first place. So they may have subverted, deleted, modified things so that you don't see the logs you're expecting to see, which is why these long-term compromises are sometimes so difficult to triage and do require careful investigation beyond the normal tools and techniques. You end up having to do uh, long-term you know, uh, exercises to do uh, malware identification and uh, and search, search searching operations, essentially, to identify what's happened on your network, what has been impacted, correlate with the data that has been leaked, time that data has been leaked, and understand uh, thoroughly the, the privilege model in your organization, what level of access employees have, so who could have been responsible for this. And it's, it's not necessarily as easy or straightforward as just trying to stop an attack from happening and you know disconnect this from the network and re-image it. You've got a much more persistent problem to deal with in those situations. Yeah, agreed, yeah. I'll, I'll just burn it to the ground uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, guys. Thank you for that one. Um, Let's run through this Reddit one. Um, keep, keep, this will be relatively short. Um, and it's a little bit different to the GoDaddy one. So the Reddit, um, and I picked this one out particularly, it's not a particularly interesting attack, it's a Christian attack. Um, one user compromised. Um, but the things I liked about it was quick response time. So um, affected user self-notified to yeah, the security team. I think something bad's happened. Security team were pretty quick to get on with it, um, triage it, work out what's gone off, um, contain it, eradicate it. Um, and then the open communication is one of the one things I want to pull out here and, and have a little discussion around. I really like the way that they've approached. This is what happened. This is what we know. This is the impact of it. And it was also just an ask us anything kind of thing post on, on Reddit. And this is it's not the first time they've done this approach. Very open. They've done it before. Um, they have They also did a, a look back at previous a, a previous compromise and said this is the lessons we've learned and shared that with the with the world. And I think just indicates to me a good culture, uh, a good security culture. I would suggest. Um, so guys, we'll just have an open chat around this one. So I don't know if you do want to do want to kick us off and just share your thoughts. It just screams of good culture, right? Where a culture where an employee is happy to self-report without fear of you know being fired, disciplined. Um, and, and, and one where Reddit are able to so quickly come out and, and explain, you know, the the, uh, the extent of the the um, attack to the to the users. Um, you know, those are those are really good signs. We've seen many many incidents previously um, where organisations have said, you know, we've, we've had an incident, we've fished. This is the extent of it. Um, maybe only being reported after um, you know people have received emails you know, individually saying that they've been compromised, you know, trying to keep everything um, you know, as, 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 as little um, information as possible. Um, and, and this just goes to show that really people, people understand, right, that phishing attacks are going to occur. Um, it's, it, it's part and parcel of, of working online. Um, but I think what really makes a difference to, you know, the customer base is, is how that is handled and responded to and, and you know reddit have absolutely hit the nail on the head here agreed yeah it mentioned in the in the right of around a, a sophisticated phishing campaign so aaron i don't know if you can be able to elaborate on what a sophisticated one looks like what a non-sophisticated one looks like yeah it's important to differentiate these days between the the low-level phishing attacks which are you know i may prince from so and so country trying to you know give you my fortune that's that's not targeted phishing that's just broad spectrum phishing the, the sophisticated phishing attacks these days are tailored to your organization and perhaps even particular employees. And they would typically mirror something that your organization is already doing. So if you use a certain shared file hosting platform and your employees are used to signing to that regularly, then perhaps the phishing email might be a file share link and they click on that and they're presented with a login page that looks identical to the one they're used to seeing. And uh, so they, they 
enter their credentials. Then they'll get an MFA prompt that's identical to the one they're used to seeing, and they'll enter their second factor and, and sign in. And in fact, what often happens is these phishing attacks are actually just acting as a forwarder, and they are actually signing you in in the back end so that when you go back to um, once you're forwarded on from that phishing page, you're actually just signed into your legitimate organization's uh, SharePoint file share or Teams instance or whatever it might be that you've signed into. And they've just captured the credentials and the MFA token in the middle, and in particular, stolen your session token so that they can now also do the same thing as you. I think that's really pertinent to be aware of here is that that's exactly how the, the Reddit attack happened. It was uh, a link that was sent to one of their internal intranet gateways and um, the MF, the, all employees at Reddit have MFA enabled, according to the Ask Me Anything that happened as a result of that attack. So it just goes to show that as much as MFA increases the bar of complexity and decreases the ease of which attackers can move around a network, it doesn't prevent it entirely because phishing attacks, sophisticated phishing attacks, are now emulating real-world authentication flows so accurately that to a user, it's almost impossible to tell what's phishing and what's not without that additional education around double checking if it's an external link. Are you expecting the the email or the, the phishing attack to happen? What I would recommend for anyone that's really curious on how to educate their employees is check out the NCSC scam guidance, which covers off scamming and social engineering and phishing all in one five point uh, chart of comparison of the key things to look out for for scams. Uh, and that's a really useful way to start educating your employees on what a phishing attack looks like. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. We, we've covered MFA in quite a few previous episodes. It's, I'm always going to err on the side of it's better than none. Um, but I think the crucial thing here is to recognize that layers are needed. So where they had a technical, they had a technical control in place, MFA, right? Um, that would have prevented, I guess in this case, it might have been more than one user credentials were, com were captured in this case only one was so that's probably stopped a, a wider impact here um and then the the you, you add layers into that so layers here have been obviously awareness training so that user then went oh something don't feel quite right i better flag that you've then got procedural controls as a layer so the ready team know exactly what to do how to do it there must be a playbook that exists i'm assuming for this type of thing to then contain eradicate so it's it's that multi-layered approach um that we talked maybe about the the onion concept previously, the security being an onion, multiple layers are better than one kind of silver bullet control. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. But the, the layers just happen to be technical uh, people and procedural uh, ultimately. And then that's fine. That's a, a completely good mix to have and uh, covers, covers a lot of bases. Um, I'd like to bang my, my favorite drum here around not all um, you know, levels of multi-factor authentication being being equal. Um, so, you know, looking specifically at this at this Reddit attack against this cloned intranet gateway, using something like hardware-based MFA with origin binding enabled would have made it physically impossible for the employee to provide their multi-factor um, credential to that cloned page because before your hardware token, you know, sends that credential matter, it says, you know, is this specifically the domain I was enrolled to? If it's not, it will not provide any matter. So, you know, that that's a great way of, of preventing, um, you know, really sophisticated cloning attacks like this working. Very good. Okay, um, let's talk the final point then around the reporting aspect. So this was, I, I think it was pretty good. So is there, is there yeah, a couple of points that, that people can take away um, and learn from this? Uh, so Aaron, maybe I'll come to you first. Yeah, sure. So well, it's important to also put into context for European organizations in particular, the GDPR requirements around reporting versus what you do or don't need to report. But actually, overall, transparency can be a good thing, especially when you're a public organization like Reddit, uh, where you've got a, a heavy internet presence and your, your reputation is around having a trust relationship with the people using your website. And in Reddit's case, that uh, the level of reporting and the speed of turnaround of, in terms of them informing everyone was actually just a couple of days. And actually their investigation internally, they were um, confident that the attack only lasted for a couple of hours before they detected and shut it down. So I think making a statement as soon as you are able to is really important, but also understanding the audience and who needs to know that statement. So if it's not impacting your users in any way, it's, an, it's important to know that sometimes by sharing that information, you may increase the level of uh, distress that is caused to users. So if, if it's a very small impacting breach that has had no material impact to data or privacy 
or details of, of individuals, then maybe you just report it internally and make a statement to say that an attack was attempted, no sensitive data was breached. But in the case of Reddit, there were some contact information of third parties they deal with breached. So they were very open and forthcoming with the, that information, listed out exactly what had been accessed. And to be clear, it wasn't user passwords and private user profile information, et cetera. It was just contact details of third parties, some code and some business documents. So it was very separate to the user database. It was more a, a marketing and sales type of, of access that was granted over the, the couple of hour window. So yeah, just understand that transparency can be good, quick reaction and public statements, having someone who's dedicated and, and who is qualified and capable to have those public conversations is really important for an organization. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Hugh, anything you want to add? Yeah, I just say that, you know, I think in a, in a lot of these instances, the way that uh, an organization handles um, these incidents actually has, has more of a reflection on them as an organization and customer confidence than the incident itself. Um, you know, a, a lot of them, you know, with, with, with companies like LastPass, I think people have, that we've, that we've looked at in previous episodes, um, the, the handling of that incident has actually had more of a detrimental impact on these companies than the incident itself. So yeah, certainly handle it well on, and, and, and you, you come out looking good, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It came from, a, I, I, it felt to me that it came from a place of confidence. So we know what's happened. We know what we've got in place. We know we've eradicated it. Therefore, we can confidently make this statement now and say that everything's all right. And the speed of it was, was quite impressive. So I think it's good to, we could, in this instance, we're highlighting um, what good looks like ultimately. So we should all try and aspire to something like the Reddit team did in this instance, I think would be good. Guys, I think that's bringing us to the end. Uh, it's been a bit of a bumper episode, so I do appreciate your time and efforts on this one. Um, final question. Are we giving up anything for Lent? Next 40 days, that's the day. Not from my perspective. I completely forgot it's Lent, I'll be honest. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, but th anyway, thank you very much. Um, we will see you all in around a month's time. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, see you then.